Let's talk about mitosis, the division slash replication of somatic cells. When we're talking about mitosis, we also have to remember the difference between mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is the division of somatic cells, and somatic cells are all cells in the body except for reproductive cells, or sex cells, as we often call them. Meiosis, or meiosis, is the division of sex cells, and of course, sex cells or reproductive cells are the ovum for the female and the sperm for the male. But this lecture, we're going to talk about mitosis, and I thank the internet greatly for all the wonderful memes out there about mitosis. I love it. So the main purpose of mitosis is for growth and to repair tissue. There's the creation of two sister cells during mitosis, and there are tons of biochemical reactions that occur before the two sister cells become two sister cells, so before that one cell is actually ready to divide. The cell life is divided into two phases, and that is interphase and the mitotic phase, which we'll break down more in a minute. And during the, the interphase, the cytoplasm, the organelles, and the genetic material have to separate in order to form those two sister cells. So sorry, that's not during interphase. Interphase, the, the organelles are replicating themselves, they're getting ready to divide, and then during mitosis, that's when the cytoplasm, the organelles, and the genetic material separate. Interphase is the period between cell division, and originally people used to think of it more as like a resting stage for the cell, so kind of like the stage is on vacation. But more recently, they've identified that that is not the case, and that interphase is actually divided into three phases. We have growth phase one, synthetic, and growth phase two. And overall, interphase is typically referred to as the metabolic phase, whereby the cell is performing its normal life-sustaining duties and then getting ready to divide. Growth one, this phase typically takes minutes to hours to days to years, so it's going to depend on the type of the cell and how fast that cell needs to get ready and get everything ready in order to undergo mitosis. During growth phase one, the cell will double in size and organelles duplicate. During synthetic state phase, it's much faster. The DNA is replicated during this phase and new identical replicas of the DNA are created. Growth phase two is also very quick and synthesis of enzymes and proteins necessary for, for cell division and growth is happening as well as, oh, and then just a side note, all phases flow as a smooth, continuous process. So it's not like growth phase one happens and then stop. Synthetic phase happens and then stop. It's all just a continuous momentum. But we like to break it down to talk about it. And then, of course, this good old joke, what did one cell say to another cell when it stepped on her foot? Ow, mitosis! Such a goodie. Again, thank you, internet. So the mitotic phase we also break down, and this one's broken down into three separate phases. We have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. A good way to remember these four phases in the order that they're in is uh, PMAT. So to use the, the first letters of each word, and it spells PMAT, which I love because us in the veterinary technician world, of course, can picture a PMAT, like a PP mat. So that's a good way to remember your four phases of mitosis, PMAT. Prophase. During this phase, the chromatin coils and then condenses into chromatin, or sorry, that's silly, into chromosomes. It coils and then condenses into chromosomes. So it's normally just hanging out within the nucleus, and then at this point, it starts to condense and coil. The nuclear envelope begins to break down, and the centrioles that are hanging out in the cell, 
they started to create spindle fiber fibers, which later played tug of war with the chromosomes during division. So keep that in mind. Now this is a very, very basic image that I saw on the internet. Easy peasy, couple of circles, couple of lines. Kid could have drawn it, and I love it. So it's identifying the spindle fibers starting to develop within the cell, and they are essentially going to be led by the centrioles. Metaphase is when the chromosomes, they start to get their, their stuff together, you know? So they start to get organized. They line up in the center of the spindle, and the centromere of each chromosome is attached now to a spindle fiber. Okay, so this is where they start to look very organized, and you can see that these are pairs of chromosomes. That's why they're in the full X format. So then when the cell divides, half the chromosome will go to the right, and half the chromosome will go to the left. Anaphase, the chromatids are pulled apart by spindle fibers to form a duplicate set of chromosomes. So that's what I was just explaining. So the X's of chromosomes now become half X's, and the cytoplasm starts to constrict at the metaphyseal plate. And I love it because the way I always picture this one is the, the chromatids yelling, help me, sister, I love you, don't leave me, as they're getting pulled apart by those spindle fibers. And so I figured somebody's got to have the same brain as me, and I was totally right. Somebody created a cartoon. I cited it at the bottom there, and it's exactly how I picture it. So in anaphase, those poor chromatids, when they created those X's, those full X's, they are now being pulled apart, pulled apart, sadness, sadness, sadness. So then half the X goes to the right side to make one cell, and half the X goes to the other side to make the other cell. And then during telophase, the chromatin begins to unravel at the poles of the cell, so on either side of the cell. A nuclear envelope appears, and cytokinesis marks the end of telophase. Cytokinesis is the cytoplasmic division. So that is what marks the end of telophase. Now what tells a cell to divide or to stay as is? From my understanding, they don't entirely understand this, but they have a couple of hypotheses that would, would potentially play into this. Most cells, once they're adult cells, they don't divide unless they're required to for repair because their growth phase is finished. Epithelial cells, on the other hand, are always dividing based on the nature of the epithelium shedding itself all the time. Nerve cells and fat cells really don't divide at all. The reasons for division inhibition, so the reasons that cells stop dividing, are technically unknown. So the two hypotheses that I was, uh, hypotheses that I was discuss, talking about, one of them is called contact inhibition. And that occurs in adult cells when they stop dividing as soon as they have contact with other cells. And the way I like to think about this one is it's similar to inviting your friends to get on to a crowded bus. So if you are shoulder to shoulder to shoulder with people on a crowded bus, you're not going to invite more people to come onto that bus. So it's as though you got the message, the bus is full, just stay still, go on your way. Another thought that cells are susceptible to release of proteins and enzymes that tell them to divide. So it's kind of like this guy wagging the flag, like go, 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 that they're susceptible to these secretions, essentially, it that tell them when to divide. So the checkpoints for go ahead for mitosis, so those checkpoints that sort of flag them to go ahead for mitosis are cyclines and cyclin-dependent kinases. And they act as signalers just to tell them all about it. So the protein synthesis, this is best described for me as a visual learner by watching a movie. You can find the movie in my playlist because it is another YouTube video. So feel free, I recommend that you watch that video first and then carry on with the boring old lecture material. So protein synthesis involves transcription, which is the genetic information in DNA is copied onto the messenger RNA. In translation, the complementary nucleotides pair with the mRNA to create the actual protein itself. And again, the video does a really good job about showing all these phases and the ins and outs of them. And it kind of gives you a really good visual of how that works. In transcription, RNA polymerase binds to the DNA molecule. 
The double helix of DNA separates and causes the nitrogenous bases of a particular gene to be exposed. Complementary nucleotides are bound to the DNA, creating messenger RNA. So essentially, it's like a copy that's now created, and that's the messenger RNA. And all protein creation or synthesis is based on this messenger RNA copy. Translation is when the ribosomes bond to the messenger RNA strand, and they trans or sorry, then the transfer RNA, tRNA, brings amino acids with the proper anticodons to the ribosome. And that allows for um, the process to carry on. So essentially what that's happening then is now we're starting to get creation of specific strands of different amino acids, which in turn is a protein. Okay, I'm just going to ignore that. That's just basic of transcription and translation. So then genetic mutations are good to know about. These are errors in DNA replication. And a mutagen is anything that causes a genetic mutation that is sort of outside the body or, or is having a factor on the body, so not intrinsically from the DNA itself. Viruses, ionizing radiation, and certain chemicals can cause genetic mutations. And of course, there is spontaneous mutation as well. So an example of a good, not a good mutagen, but a mutagen is panleukopenia and cerebellar hyperplasia, hypoplasia. Sorry. So essentially, this happens when adult female cats are pregnant and they acquire panleukopenia, which is a really devastating virus for cats anyways. It causes tons of diarrhea, tons of vomiting, and they just, they just fall apart. They're off. They look awful. So if the pregnant cat makes it through the panleukopenia outbreak, then her kittens are very likely to be born with cerebellar hypoplasia. And it affects the cerebellum in their brain. Essentially, it's a decrease in all the tissue that they need to have an actively working cerebellum. And the cerebellum is mostly responsible for our coordinated movements. So kittens and cats, adult cats who have cerebellar hypoplasia, you often don't see it <clears throat> in kittens for the first couple months. And then as they grow, as their brains grow and develop, you start to see these really specific clinical signs. So there is a video, and I'll put it in my playlist as well. And it's just a little kitten who's got cerebellar hyperplasia, hypoplasia. Sorry, I keep messing that up. And it's nicknamed as the drunken sailor disease for cats. So they are just totally wobbly, totally ataxic, and they look like they drank too much and then tried to walk. Cats who have cerebellar hypoplasia can live a decent, long, healthy life. That's really important to know. So it's definitely not a death sentence when they get this genetic mutation. It's non-progressive. So essentially what they have by a year of age is what they'll have for the rest of their life. Things that we always do have to be cautious of because they are essentially like a drunk person in a way. We have to watch any danger that they could get into. So not allowing them an opportunity to be exposed to an area that they could hurt themselves. So that's just typical client education that you might provide to an owner who has one of these cute little kittens. And then moving on, just carrying on with things that happened essentially within the trans transcription of the DNA. Cell differentiation involves the temporary or permanent inhibition of genes that may be active in other cells so that those genes don't necessarily show up. And that is all for today. And the sound of my feet, it slowed me down.